Welcome to this week's episode of the PS We Expire podcast. I'm your host, Morgan Motsinger. Welcome to episode 21. Apparently, a lot of episodes, a lot of podcasts don't actually make it this far. And so I'm just celebrating a little win today with having episode, having uh, recorded 21 episodes. So wherever you are, just do a little like yay shake for me uh, as we have journeyed through 21 episodes together. I'm really glad that you're here. So the conversation that you are going to listen to today is between me and Marissa and Marissa is a spiritual coach and she used to be an executive recruiter before she had a pretty significant personal awakening to discovering for herself that the life that she had was not a life that really was in deep alignment with who she is and what she actually needs. And so today we will be talking about what it takes to actually make a significant shift in life to get in alignment and what that looked like, that personal journey looked like for her. Before we get into the episode, I do want to also tell you about a free ebook that I have on my website called Know Thyself. So as so many of these conversations on this podcast revolve around how do you change your life? How do you change your mind? How do you adopt new beliefs that actually help you create the life that brings so much joy and fulfillment to you? And the first stop on this journey is that you have to actually know what you've got going on in there. You have to actually know what you want in life. Have you ever actually paused to ask yourself that question? What do I want? This ebook is going to walk you through three of my favorite personality profiling tools as a way for you to just unlock little parts of yourself that maybe have been dormant for a long time or that you have suppressed or hidden or didn't even know were there and also guide you through some of these big questions about what do you want your life to look like help you develop practical ways to take steps to make that happen so you can go to my website morganmotzinger.com and you'll see that free ebook download available right there so thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the ps we expire podcast i'm so glad that you are here Marissa, I am so happy to have you on the PS We Expire podcast for so many reasons. Um, Before we kind of jump into what you do and how we can apply the things that you have learned through your own personal experience and also through your professional experience to our lives, um, can you talk a little bit about like the path that got you to where you're at right now? I went from being a corporate recruiter, basically, to being a spiritual coach, (laughs) just quite the transition. And that transition was really a culmination of a lot of different factors and, and circumstances that led me to what I believe is my purpose. I, like a lot of women, was kind of on this expected path uh, as a high achiever, type A. I checked all the boxes. I I got a master's degree. I traveled the world. I got married, had kids, and woke up feeling dissatisfied and and unfulfilled uh, despite having done all of that, Um, had the achievements, the titles, good job, money, nice house, family. But there was something that was missing within me. And I think that's a common experience for a lot of women, especially when they get to that um, mid thirties kind of point, right. Is this kind of identity crisis, if you will, especially high achieving women, because we tend to follow what is laid out in front of us and uh, do the things that give us that external validation that we are good as, as achievers. Mm -hmm. So I, I followed this path and um, got to a point where just didn't resonate with me anymore. And I I felt like I was hiding. I felt like I was disconnected from who I was meant to be and just decided to really grab hold of that, that burning desire within me and find the courage to really just tear everything down. Hmm. Um, Skipping over a lot of drama, (laughs) a lot of story there. But uh, I, it started when I decided to get a divorce and to rebuild and to really look at what I was creating, recognizing that I was actually creating it, 
I wasn't a victim. I had a choice. And recognizing that and owning that, uh, that, it, that I had a choice meant I had to do something about it. Right? And I couldn't just sit back and, and allow my life to just float anymore or just go by. I had to be intentional, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to create tearing things down and getting intentional, getting clear was really the starting point for me. Um, and I decided to explore some different ways to get that clarity. Uh, I went through therapy, which is traditional, but, um, I'm an Aquarius and I'm kind of out there. So I thought, you know, I'm going to look at some other, uh, approaches I'm going to look at some different ways to heal and to get into that, that, that in, inner feeling, that inner knowing really explain it. So I started getting Reiki and then I started working with a spiritual mentor, just sensing that it was maybe something of a spiritual mentor so, or spiritual um, nature. So I ended up having this awakening and healing and really discovering that I had uh, these intuitive gifts and I had um, an, a purpose and a legacy within me and what that was. And in finding that, I also found the confidence and the courage to bring that forward. Um, albeit it's taken me a few years, it's, it's quite a uh, undertaking to embrace going from, you know, a corporate executive recruiter mm. uh, identity to showing up and saying, hey, I'm a spiritual coach. Mm. <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 um, there's a lot of vulnerability in that and a lot of fear, uh, around, you know, judgment and criticism, but I think that's true with anything that we do. So, um, it's been a journey for me in embracing that. And, and, and just think when you know that it's connected to your purpose, there's a different level of commitment that you're willing to put forward. Mm -hmm. And there's, you, you show up more and more and more until you get there. You know, there's a different level of perseverance. And so here I am fully uh, embodied in, in that identity and, and living that out and um, yeah, trying to make an impact. Hmm. What there's so many things that, that I have questions about within just what you shared, but one of the things that piqued my interest is that it seems like there is this separation between what is acceptable and what is asked for in a corporate community versus a spiritual community. And I'm so curious from your perspective and your experience, why aren't those things copacetic? Like why isn't there integration yeah. of all those parts? And, and what is, what are the barriers between being able to integrate a, a sense of spirituality and higher purpose into those corporate spaces? Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I think that's changing. I really do. I think that's, it, it's a historical cultural effect whereby religion, uh, spirituality, you know, anything of like God, divine source that falls into that bucket um, is undoubtedly, it's, it's a personal choice. And we live in a society and a culture historically that doesn't really allow for people to be people at work. You know, mm. the, the the track record has been, we expect you to show up and to wear a suit and to do your job and not have emotions and not have opinions and, you know, be extremely productive and go home and take all your, you know, stuff from your personal life home. And now I think we're in this interesting time, especially post COVID, where we're starting to say and acknowledge like, we are human at work. Mm. We are, we bring all of our surprise, all of our stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like we, we're not robots, you know, mm. we don't just like check our humanness at the door when we punch in for the day and then become human when we leave again. Um, that's just who we are at home as who we are at work. And, and we mm. have the same patterns and the same emotions and the same triggers. And so now I think where that is starting to shift is you have people who are highly successful coming forward and um, kind of coming out of the spiritual closet, if you will, mm. like Oprah um, and even Lewis Howes, for instance, um, and, you know, Rich Roll and 
Joe Rogan and all kinds of like people along the spectrum of masculine and feminine and um, all different identities who are very successful people who are now saying, this is, this is the thing, right. Or the, the piece of myself that I really had to develop to become my most successful in every aspect of my life, including my career. So I think now it's being um, normalized in a new way by people in the business world, even Ariana Huffington, right? A lot of her um, content is, is very spiritual in nature. So we're now recognizing as a culture, as a society, that this is an important part of who we are. And it's got benefits far beyond just feeling good and feeling fluffy and woo-woo. Like mm-hmm. there are, there's scientific benefit to being a spiritual person and there, there is a, a value in that for our lives that that's immeasurable. And now the, I think the, the work for people like myself who are wanting to really uh, continue to normalize that and to do that work is, is to show people how. Okay. So mm. now you've accepted that this is an important part of your life. This is a, a, a piece of your identity or your wholeness that needs to be nurtured and developed just as your mental health and your physical health. So mm. how do I do that? How do yeah. I go and do that? And you know, how do I integrate these sound bites from Oprah and Gabby Bernstein and yeah. you know, Lewis Housen? How do I actually live that? Too? Yeah. I think what's so fascinating about thinking about um, the spiritual life finally trickling into our work life or career life or corporate life is that so much of the corporate machine is about being able to measure and adjust for particular outcomes. And spirituality is really messy and it also Mm -hmm. is highly individualistic. And so there isn't, and this is where I think people get frustrated when it comes to doing uh, personal development and personal growth and spiritual spiritual growth and development is that no one can give you the formula for how to make this work. Like this isn't a funnel that has a proven technique to get this outcome that is, you know, measurable and you just tweak a little thing here and there. Like this is highly experimental on each individual level. And mm-hmm. what I find to be so just fascinating and also frustrating about that is how many people that have this kind of corporate mindset come to the spiritual teachings with that same way of like, this is the way you do it. This is the formula. And I, I feel like what I shout from the rooftops over and over and over again is like, you cannot outsource that work to anybody else. Like you cannot ask somebody else for a formula and be like, yes, I'm going to stick to it because anytime we source our purpose and our progression to someone else, we're missing out on the most important piece to the growth, which is autonomy and personal accountability. And so when, when you were sharing your story of, you know, moving from this life that should have been satisfying because everybody told you that is what a satisfied life looks like. And here's all the things that you need to do and discovering like, oh, that's not at my core actually what I want and what I need to flourish as a human being, then, Mm -hmm. then things started to change. And so we have to get out of this, this mindset of thinking like somebody else can tell me what the path is. And it is really difficult because it requires a significant amount of effort on an individual level to find out what works for you. Yes. I, I would agree with that. I would add that I think that this is something that I've struggled with. Okay. Because also when I was starting my spiritual journey, I very much, I'm very much the same. I like plans and frameworks and Mm. type A and I'm an achiever. So I'm like, give me the plan and I will work it until it's Mm. like, you know, you, you show me a path to make, you know, X amount of dollars and you give me every step of it, I will crush it. Right. That's just like the mentality. So it is very hard for high achievers to shift away from that. But I think you can actually, and I, it, this is something I've figured out for myself that I now have to work through with my clients is you can actually harness that. And there are frameworks and tools that you can apply to, um, to, to utilize that strength. Okay. So Mm. to give you an example, so I created this model that I'm, I'm building a, a free live training around right now. 
And it's about manifesting and kind of creating your best life. And it's called the rise up model. Okay. So it's an acronym and it's a practice. It's a daily practice. So it's saying, okay, well, first you have to release your attachment. You have to release and let go of whatever it is you're holding on to that day, control, trauma, you know, release your limited beliefs. So, so start with releasing that, which is holding you back. Um, tap into your intuition, hmm. um, show up, you know, show up every day embodied in whatever it is that you're trying to create, um, energize what it is that you're trying to create instead of energizing your past, uh, ask for support from the universe, recognize that the universe is supporting you, look for signs, you know, pray in a way that feels authentic to you and then play. Hmm. You've got to play. You have to have fun. And so if you just follow those six steps every single day, then you are living a spiritual existence, hmm. really. So I think there are ways, and, and for some people that might be three hours of meditation and their prayer might be like a very, uh, you know, it might be to God, it might be to Buddha, it might be just like an affirmation. So you, there's still room within that to find your own um, spiritual center that feels authentic, but there are ways that you can apply like a framework or a tool or a model hmm. to those people who like that kind of a process, you know, and then and, and the, from a neuroplasticity standpoint, I actually think having a framework, a process, a path is great because if you've got something, a plan you can work and you can do it day after day after day, then you're going to over time, obviously rewire and get a different result, hmm. which consistency and time is really the main driver of change. So I think it's just kind of shifting that, shifting that framework from like, okay, this is, this is what you need to know to like, this is what you need to practice in order to know for yourself what is true and right and authentic for you. Mm. not like adopting somebody else's truth. Yeah. I think what I, what I was referring to is like the, the people would be like, what's your morning routine? Like I need to yeah. know <laughs> from 6 a.m. Yeah. to 7 a.m. Like, what are you doing? And then they try and put on somebody else's routine so that they can have the same results as that person. But I, what I appreciate about what you're saying is like that there are tools that have been used for thousands and thousands of years mm -hmm as a way to tap into that part of yourself and to, you know, to turn up our nose at these techniques that have worked for so long and that we have been able to prove through modern science. Like there actually is stuff like happening in your brain when you are in yes. a meditative state, you know, things like that, but it's like finding, okay, what type of meditation actually works for me and mm -hmm. what type of morning routine works for me. And I might be able to look at this person and say like, oh, I can't, I feel like two of the 10 things that they do actually resonate with me and feel good to me and fit yes. in with my lifestyle and my choices and having the flexibility to say, I'm going to try things. If they don't work, I can discard them. Um, and knowing that that can change over time too, as you mm -hmm. turn into a different person, you don't have to hang on to that thing that worked for you, you know, two years ago with all your might and yes. insist that that's going to work forever. So it is having that flexibility to say, I'm just going to, I'm going to test and see what's right for me, but I love what you're saying. And I think this is so, so important. And so key is that we have to be okay with sticking with something long enough to see if it actually works, you know, like I can't go yes. to the gym <laughs> and lift weights one day and be like, yeah. sweet. Like I'm, I'm set now. I'm, I'm, I've got the muscles that I want and I, yeah. you know, whatever it's like, no, you have to, you have to put in the routine and the consistency to be able to yeah. build up those resilience muscles. You do. And I think that, um, as when it comes to having a spiritual practice, I think it's one of the things most commonly that people tend to relinquish when they're busy or, mm. you know, they're feeling a certain way. And, um, for me, I've, I've had to make that the, the, the front and center priority every day. Um, and this is why I love hearing these messages from really, really highly successful people who are, are talking about the power of thought and mm. beliefs and, um, you know, creating from visioning and meditation, because 
it truly is the difference between for me, for me, right? It, it truly was the difference between working 60 hours a week, being totally burnt out, struggling financially, and not really enjoying my life, missing out on quality time with my kids, hmm. to working half of the time, enjoying my life, doing things that light me up and doubling my income. The only thing I changed was me, was my belief and my perspective and trust. So I began to see that I was creating my life, that my life was not happening to me. That was one of the strongest messages that um, came from my spiritual development and learning and growth was like, oh my goodness, I am not a victim. And so that, as I said before, really put a new level of um, ownership on me, but was also very liberating and empowering because it allowed me to say, okay, well, then it's in my hands. It's in my hands. So I was able to really refocus on what I wanted and heal the things that were preventing me from getting there and just let go of like the grinding and the hustling and the forcing and just really lean into trust and surrender and to say like, all right, you know, today I'm going to handle these things and I'm going to hand these things over to my spirit team. And I'm going to trust and say, show me, like, show me the way, show me what to do. I'm going to leave these things up to you. And it, it just really allowed me to let go, to let go, to be more present and to really focus on the things that that I enjoy. Cause like at the end of the day, mm. isn't life supposed to also be fun? <laughs> what? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, what is, what is it going to be like when we get to the end of our lives and we're not going to be like, I wish I had less fun. <laughs> I wish I had yes. less fun in my life. What do people need to know about the difference between our spiritual life and our emotional life and our physical life? Well, they're all interconnected right? They're all interconnected. Um, the body, I mean, what I would say is our spiritual self is the most unaffected by anything else that's going on with our humanness, right? So even though it's an intricate system, our higher self, if you will, is somewhat detached from that. Okay. So when you're feeling emotional, you know, you're experiencing something physically, you can access your higher self to shift both of those things. Just as if you're feeling spiritually disconnected or you're feeling emotionally low, you could go for a run and you might get all of this like intuitive hit because you've, you've kind of cleared out that channel. You've cleared out the emotion. You feel better. You feel connected. You've you might see a beautiful sunset and you might be like, oh gosh, I'm so grateful to be alive. So, I mean, they all really work together, right? They, they're just all pieces of a system, um, but they all have different reasons for, for existing. <laughs> mm. I mean, I, I, I think they all kind of inform each other in different ways. So how does, how, how in your experience and then what you have found when working with clients is how, how do you help people tap into that? spiritual self and develop that spiritual attunement. The hardest part of that is starting to get the awareness of what is going on in your mind. So, and you and I talked a little bit about this, but um 95% of our daily thoughts are subconscious. And that means they're the same every day and they're outside of our awareness. So we only spend about 5% of our day in conscious thought. Consciousness is that like objective higher self part of us. Subconscious is programming and it's often rooted in trauma or past behavior or pattern, right? So what happens is we get really mired in like our subconscious and we over identify with the mind. So we start to, you know, think like I'm this, I'm that, we label ourselves um, I'm unlovable. Like there's all this stuff really deep, these limited beliefs rooted really, really deep within us. And so the first part of spiritual growth and development is knowing what's there. Mm. If you don't know what's there, you can't challenge it. You can't, you can't um, confront it and you can't make new declarations that you can then 
energize and affirm and embody and step into and create from. So the first part is, is heavy. You know, it's really um, going back into your trauma, going back to um, those moments when you made these decisions about yourself or about the world where you separated from your power and separated from your divinity and recognizing what those limited beliefs are for you that are uniquely rooted in your psyche. And then once you're aware, it's about, okay, well, what do I want to embody moving forward and getting ultra clear on what it is that you want to embody? And once you've done that, then you can start to show up and embody that. And you can start to then meditate and start like listening to yourself and start consuming material that's going to support you in understanding who you are and where you want to be and also help you get there. Mm. So it's a messy journey. It's a really messy journey. And in the beginning for most of my clients, the first four weeks, it's like, oh, that's a lot, you know, going back to that. But you have to heal those stories. And, and, and usually by about the sixth week of working together, um, I, I use this phrase all the time, but um, you end up becoming, and the goal is to become basically a conscious observer of your thoughts. Hmm. When you can become a conscious observer of your thoughts, you can make a different choice. You are liberated and empowered and you can see it from the eyes of your higher self and you can act differently. Hmm. When you are in your thoughts, you can only see the world from that perspective. When you can step out of that role and you can look down on yourself and you can say, oh, wait, this isn't about this person saying this thing to me and they're a bad person and I'm angry with them and I blame them and I feel mad and all this negative emotion. That thing that that person said to me means to me that I'm not good enough. And that's what I'm hearing and because I feel like I'm not good enough, I'm angry and I'm all of these things. And actually, I just need to reaffirm within myself, I'm okay. And I don't need to lash out at that person. I don't need to make them wrong. I don't need to argue or have conflict. Hmm. I just need to know that this is about me healing that part of me. And I can go and do that on my own. So it just creates a much more accountable existence where you're actually focused on recognizing where you still need to grow and then actually doing the healing so that you can become much less reactive and a lot more accountable and responsible for your own physical, emotional experience. Do some people come to you thinking that this is like, okay, once I address these, you know, subconscious beliefs and programs and patterns and I heal my trauma, then like it's smooth sailing from here on out. I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think so. Cause I'm very, I don't know. I, I think I like to think I'm very honest about just like anything, any, if everything in life is a journey and, and your spirituality is the same and like your spiritual well-being is no different to your mental well-being or your physical well-being. And I, I really try to set the stage of like, I'm going to give you the tools that you need and the perspective and the wisdom to figure it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. This is about them being able to listen to themselves. That is authenticity. That authenticity, living an authentic existence is really at the, at the core, just being able to know what you really, really want deep down and being able to live in alignment with that. I asked that a little bit tongue in cheek because yeah, because it's not a one and done thing because there will always no. be things that surprise us that come up that we didn't know were there. And so I appreciate what you're saying about having the tools and that it's like, it almost feels like the initial understanding of the awareness that is accessible to us through being able to be a conscious observer of our thoughts and of our, our patterns and behaviors is like that first kind of like hurdle to get over. Yes. And once, once you get over that, then of course, like there are still going to be times when we act in an unconscious way and we lash out at people. And, and then it's only in hindsight that we see, Oh, oh, like, I wish that I had done that differently. Or I see how I was activated here and I don't need to be activated here. And this is bringing yes. up and bringing to my conscious awareness, the things that I need to work on. So it's not, 
yeah, it's not a one and done thing, but I do think that there is like that initial hurdle that some of what's contained in that initial hurdle is that piece of personal responsibility where, where we just got, we get so sick and tired of feeling like you said, like life is happening to me. And when we get tired enough of that rhetoric, that is not true and not helpful, then we're like, okay, boom. Like that's when the the power is introduced to be able to make positive change. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I I was saying to this to one of my, my clients this morning is, you know, she was saying, uh, that her friend was telling her, you don't need to change. You're perfect as you are. You're, you know, perfectly like divinely perfect. And she was feeling kind of conflicted over this. And, And my response was, she's hundred percent, right. You don't have to change. This isn't about changing. This is about freeing your soul from the prison of your mind Mm. to become who you really are and to recover who you are divinely perfect and to let go of who you've become. It's not to change who you are. It's actually to read reclaim who you are Mm. because it's through living that we become we become separate from who we are. And it's trauma that makes us become separate from who we are. Like the world tells us we're too much or, Mm -hmm. you know, our parents tell us, you know, don't say that, don't act that way. You know, you won't, you won't be loved if you do this or, or we get in situations where we're not safe. And so we, we bury parts of ourselves. And so really, I think the greatest act of self-love in kindness in, in the world is, is to, um, give yourself the opportunity to recover who you are. How, I mean, kind of getting into the weeds here a little bit with the spirituality mm-hmm. piece, when we talk about our, our higher self, I, you know, I think about it like our deeper self. Yeah. That part of ourself that's untouched by trauma, that's untouched by all the coping techniques that we have is untouched by mm-hmm. other people's projections on us or the ways that we have layered up to keep ourselves safe how do you think about our, our, I was going to say that piece of ourselves, but it's not even a piece of ourselves. Like it is us. (laughs) Yeah. This is where they're kind of coming back to uh, what we were talking about earlier. This is part of like adopting beliefs that, you know, some people want to do and some people don't want to go down this path. But so for me in my spiritual journey, um, I learned about a lot of these like commonly held spiritual concepts, which I'm all, I'm putting all of them in my book. But um, one of them that I learned about is like having this, this concept that we have this, this soul plan, right. Or this blueprint. Mm. So we have a soul. And again, I'm repeating, you know, what are some common beliefs within this spiritual community, which is we have this, this soul that has karma from past lives and has lessons and uh, goals for us and a purpose and a legacy within this lifetime. So it has a mission. Let's just say it has a mission. And that within that blueprint within us is a set of like experiences or key experiences, a a loose kind of map that we need to experience um, or endure or um, celebrate in order to kind of deliver that mission and reach that, that legacy alongside that is the idea that we have a, we have spirits and spirit guiding us, whether you want to call that God or source energy or the law of attraction or spirit guides or angels. We have all of this, these sources of information available to us that we can tap into to help us also get to where we need to be and to kind of unlock that legacy and bring that forward. So for me, the higher self is kind of like this mix of all of these things. And so I, I'm very deep in the weeds on this. Mm-hmm. So um, what I would say is I think that we have a soul within us that has some meaning and some purpose to simplify. And then we also have access to this other wisdom that can guide us and can support us. And I think it's less important what you call it and more important that you're in touch with it. 
and that you acknowledge it. And when you acknowledge it, it will work with you, whether that's, you know, prayer or affirmation or going to church or literally just meditating for everybody. It's going to be different to your point in the beginning about individuality of, of kind of that spiritual experience, but you have to be able to sense it. You got to sharpen your ability to, to hear it, to sense it, to recognize it and to know it. It's mm. just a knowing. And it's so uncomfortable for us because we aren't trained to use that sense. Mm. You know, if we see it with our eyes, we're like, it exists, you know, but if we can't see it and we're not trained to see it, then it's a much harder thing for us to, to, to feel confident in following. You know, if we have this knowing we'll, we'll listen to what other people say or what we, we see being done before we'll often kind of trust that, that inner knowing. Mm. Um, and so for me, it, like the whole spiritual journey is about learning to really, um, prioritize that, that sense. What does that, your experience. what does that feel like to you? that, mm. that knowing. And I, I mean, I know that this is kind of a tricky question because I'm asking for you to describe something that often is indescribable and ineffable. Um, mm. but if you can, like, what, what does that inner knowing feel like to you? Yeah, it's actually very simple. It's just a very decisive, it's just a very decisive instantaneous knowing it's like, I, I use this analogy. It's terrible, but it, it lands with people. Is like when you go out to eat and you're looking at a menu mm. and like the first thing, right? Like the mm-hmm. first thing that you see that really hits you, you're like, oh, that cheeseburger looks so good. Right? <laughs> you're just like, I want that cheeseburger. Mm. And then you're like, and you know, you're, you're ready. And then you start looking at the menu some more and you're talking and someone's like, no, oh, ooh, this salmon looks really good. And you start thinking like, Oh, you know, I really want to fit into my jeans again. And maybe I should have a salad. Hmm. So your brain kicks in, brain kicks in and takes over and all this thought happens. And then you make a different decision. And then you get the salad and you're like, I wish I would have had that cheeseburger. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's the same. It's the same thing as intuition is decisive. It's clear. And it's usually the very first impulse. Hmm. So how do you help people distinguish between that intuition and then something that might be a trigger to some trauma or old programming? Because that also can be pretty quick to come to the surface when presented with options. Yeah. Yeah. So it's looking at the nature of it. So your intuition is not fear-based. I would say doesn't carry human traits, right? So it's usually not envy or judgment or, um, fear or lack. It's, it's the confident, I don't want to say positive, more like neutral sense. Right. And, and sometimes it's really small things. Like for me, a lot of the time, because I am so tapped in, I will lose something and I'm just like backpack, you know? And Mm. I'm just like, it's in that backpack I haven't used for a week or like, you know, it's just like, it just, it just happens, you know, it's just following those impulses to make your life easier. You know, Mm. I think uh, what, what came up for me was how I feel when I am in nature Mm. is this, this, like, it doesn't feel in conflict, but it feels like this, uh, synergistic sense of being in a state of awe and feeling yes. so insignificant and also feeling so unique and important. And it does, yes. it does bypass all of the logical, whatever. And it just sits in my body in a way that feels pe- like peace. And yes. the times when I have been tapped in enough to that spiritual guidance and that deeper part of me, it's that it feels, the, it tastes the same. It tastes the yeah. same. And where I have gotten into problems myself, gotten myself into trouble is when that intuition, that intuitive knowing goes against so much of my logic. And then I talk yes. myself out of it. Like, I don't even need to have other people chiming in and talking me out of it. Like I do a really good job talking myself out of it. Yep. So can you address this topic of 
self-trust and like you, you had, you shared bef- that you had like some significant shifts in your life that came mm-hmm. from a place of deep knowing. How did you trust yourself to make those choices when there was so much unknown and unease on the other side of yeah. that? A couple of things come to mind. The first is um, baby steps, baby steps. You know, we live in, again, this, this day and age where everyone wants everything fast (laughs) right now, (laughs) you know, and, um, get that Amazon prime. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Get that door. Bring it by by drone. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, pretty much now. Um, so it's, it was learning, which, which was hard for me. I am not a baby stepper. So, Mm. um, it was baby stepping into things and treating it as, an experiment and a learning, not like I'm going to change my life and I'm going to become, I didn't set out to become a spiritual person. I didn't know that that was my purpose. Hmm. I literally just wanted to heal and to feel good. And I had this intuitive feeling and I was in such a low place that I was willing to try something new. And I was willing to trust because I had nothing else had worked for me. You know, and I think sometimes it really takes getting to this place where nothing else is working and you're at rock bottom to, to be willing to open up your mind to something else. And, you know, having a master's degree in psychology and having a successful career, I'm like, I should be able to figure this out. Mm. But like, I can't seem to intellect my way out of this pain and this, like this discomfort and this void. So I have to try something new. So I started just baby stepping into it and I hired, I I invested in people that I felt connected to and that I felt could help me. I did not do it alone. Hmm. And I think that that is the key to success in anything in life. You try to do anything alone, one brain in one source of energy, you're only going to get yourself back, Hmm. you know, um, the same brain that caused the problem usually isn't the one that fixes it, right? It's <laughs> kind of the, the classic thing. So yeah, taking my time um, step by step so that it was somewhat within my comfort zone and then finding the support that I really needed to um, find my way, to find mm-hmm. my way and, and, and feel um, held and seen and heard and to feel like I was really getting to, to what, to, to something. When people are in a state of pain, when they get to that point where they feel like I cannot continue to do things the way that I've been doing them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that what is required then is for people to blow up their, (laughs) blow up their lives? You know, I mean, you, you kind of already answered that in saying like, it was a step-by-step process. I wouldn't say, uh, well, I had to blow up my life. Hmm. But then to create something new was more of a step-by-step. Oh, gotcha. So I would say, um, I don't think people have to blow up their lives. No, I think that people can say, you know, I'm really interested in this thing and I recognize that I'm interested in it or I want to heal this and I'm going to start on that journey. And maybe like I have a client of mine who is um, really passionate about photography and she wants to be a Mm -hmm. photographer. And she also is a really amazing physical therapist and she loves her job. So for her, it's like, okay. Um, and she loves photography because she's making other women feel good about themselves and feel seen mm-hmm. and feel heard, which is very healing for her given her past and her trauma. So it's, it's, it's helpful for her in her healing journey as well. So, you know, for her, it's like, you know, finding, finding a, a, a balanced middle ground and finding a balanced way to start to step into that path that doesn't, that doesn't require her to just give up everything and have no job and no money. You know, I think mm-hmm. a lot of times people think they have to like sacrifice for their purpose. <laughs> so right. like they have to like flip their lives on their head. No, yeah. to answer your question. I don't think you do, but the caveat on that is that I do believe just based on what I know of psychology that people rarely um, are in a position to really make some sort of huge change unless they've lost 
they've had a significant loss, right? Mm -hmm. Or they've reached a certain level of hopelessness. Um, sadly, it takes kind of that, that rock bottom for a lot of people to actually be willing to, to put in the work to do the change. They have to really mm -hmm. feel like that extreme level of pain before yeah. they will, um, they will put in the effort. I just saw an illustration today of, you know, there's the little person on this side and then there's this yeah. big, big black cloud of pain. And on the other yes. side is like your most expansive joy filled life. And the only yeah. way is through the pain. And so people get stuck here. They keep looping back and back, 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 back yes. until so in the, in the image that came up for me was like, until the pain on this side of things forces them through this pain of the unknown yes. into the more expansive life. And yeah. no one, no one can tell you what this pain on, you know, on the backside of things is going to be. But I think you're right that that is, unfortunately, <laughs> pain is, unfortunately, unfortunately, pain is such a fast, deep teacher because yes. it almost is, you know, pain is, is one of the ways that we get out of ourselves and mm -hmm. like we were talking about before, like when our patterns and our habits are so very close to us, when we're stuck in our own heads, pain yeah. has a way of like popping us out of that narrow perspective and being like, hey, there's actually a bigger wide world out here. There are more perspectives available to you than you even know right now. There are more ways of being, more ways of living, more ways of living in your purpose and finding meaning than what you can see right now in this. And pain has a way of, of just like nudging us out of that comfortable, safe spot. Even if, even if that comfortable spot we know is not good for us, but our brains are like, mm -hmm. stay here at all costs, stay where it's comfortable, stay where it's familiar. That's literally what our brains are designed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, our brains are not the, I mean, yes, we come up with innovative ideas. Yes. We, you know, can use our brains in all sorts of wonderful ways. But really, from a biological and evolution standpoint, our brains are really just designed to keep us safe, mm. you know, and that's why, it, and, and that becomes really problematic in an expansive society where um, our brains still default to like uh, uh, stereotypes and um, shortcuts, you know, shortcuts mm. and trauma reinforces these shortcuts so that we can, we can, our lives can be saved. Right. So like alert, 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 like this feels familiar. And this is, this is dangerous. Um, when we got now live in this like really expansive society, it just, it doesn't really fit with like, with, with some of the goals that we, we have as humans now, right? Like, I think we're evolving really do feel like we are evolving as a species and as a collective, I think consciousness is, is raising. And I, I think, um, and I'm stealing this from a session I had with a few entrepreneurs in Lewis Howes last week in person, which is peace is the new currency. You know, mm. people just want peace. And I think spirituality is what gives you p inner peace. It's like when you can see the world from the eyes of source and you can recognize the oneness. So coming back to what you were saying about being in nature, right? Like when you can recognize, um, and, and you, you know, you said logically, you know, you've got all this other stuff going on. And really, I would say like the most logical thing that we miss all the time is that we are the world. Hmm. We are rivers and wind and mountains and water. I mean, not to sound like a total hippie, but like truly, if you look at the chemical makeup of humans, right. at the most <laughs> like, big, like, smallest level we're just a collection of cells mm. and so is everything else in this world we are not like this we're not made up of some sort of different material everything there's just all oneness and energy is just flowing all the time from person to person and you know thing to thing and so I think when you can recognize that oneness you can start to and, and you can take responsibility for your own circumstances and you can recognize that you that things are happening to you for you and that maybe your soul actually constructed this for growth, you can let go of a lot of blame hmm. and you can let go of a lot of making people wrong and you can access, at least for me, a, a, a lot 
of newfound compassion mm-hmm. and understanding and empathy for other people. And you just move through the world differently when you, when you do that. You know, yeah. you're not, oh, why did this person say that? And why are they wearing that? And just like all this nonsense use of energy um, that comes from the ego. You you just, you, you don't engage in that anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, that spirituality and, and really nurturing that development is where you find your peace. Yeah. I wrote down in our healing, we heal others, mm-hmm. which is... Yes which is exactly when you're talking about something like uh, peace being a, being the currency. <clears throat> it's interesting to use like financial terms when we talk about things like peace. Um, but I think that the analogy helps a lot because in, in the business sense, if you're selling something that is uh, in, intangible, uh, it can feel very difficult to know how to sell that, you know, or how to, yeah. how to make sure that people are exchanging something that they value for what you value. And you know, that it's going to enrich their life is probably a better way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in an understanding that everybody around us is positively impacted when we heal ourselves, Absolutely. that it is, that it is a, a collective good when we yeah. are digging into our um, trauma, when we're digging into our patterns that are unhelpful, that we're digging into that connection to source, that what that Mm -hmm. means is then we are, like you said, we're becoming more aware of our connection to each other. And that is how we continue to bring peace. And so as an encouragement to people who feel like, what good is this doing? Like, I'm just on this journey by myself. No, you're not like you, you are Mm -hmm. inextricably connected to everything else. So when you are doing the work to elevate your awareness to an understanding that we are all one, that we're all having this human experience together, that is what elevates all of us at the same time. And perhaps not at the same speed, not to the same level, it doesn't matter because it enriches everyone's lives and it brings all Mm -hmm. of us to this understanding of that, that we are all connected. What, what a phenomenal way for us to view the other people that we get to, to live with and that we get to share this human experience with, because you're right. Like our brains, our brains are wired to label things and to categorize things Mm -hmm. and to put things into boxes. And when we do that with people without the understanding that Like, oh, you're actually, you're me, (laughs) you're me. I'm you that the things that I'm experiencing may be different than the things that you're experiencing, but we all have shared emotion that you have, you have felt heartbreak. You have felt loss. You have felt pain. Mm -hmm. You have felt grief just like I have. And that will always be the connective tissue that keeps this collective, uh, evolving together. When, um, you posted something the other day about, your son's diagnosis, um, Mm -hmm. that he's on the autism spectrum and, and what the doctor said to you. And I, I want to talk a little bit about what life is like Mm -hmm. for you, um, with having a child with special needs. Uh, I don't know if you like that terminology or use that terminology or not. That just happens to be what works for me and my experience with my child. Mm -hmm. Um, but talk a little bit about, um, what life looks like for you um, mm-hmm. with a son who has additional needs and, and what the doctor said to you and, and what, what your response was to that, I think is just mm. such a phenomenal thing to be able to share. Yeah. So, um, that's, there's a lot to unpack there and I'll, I'll start with, um, I'll start with the diagnosis piece and my response to that, because I think what life looks like is it, is it, a a very layered response. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, I'll start with the first, which is, you know, three years old. Um, we're taking him to the doctor, uh, to have this evaluation at this point in time, I had already accepted that, that this diagnosis was coming. And, um, for me, and, and I know a lot of, a lot of people are very resistant to a diagnosis. 
and to each their own. For me, I find that it, it um, having an answer or having a, you know, having a diagnosis meant that there were, there were options, there were options for, for enrichment of his life in terms of, you know, ABA therapy, which is something he's been involved with since he was three. So I had, I had already kind of accepted it and, and, um, was not surprised that that was, was the diagnosis in any way, shape or form. But what was surprising to me was when, uh, like I said, in, in my post, the doctor kind of took a different bit of a turn and, and said, listen, I just, I want you to be aware. And I, I genuinely believe it was from a very caring place and a, a, a want and desire to educate and to prepare and said, you know, you should know and, and be prepared for the fact that a lot of parents, most parents who have children with special needs do not reach their fullest career potential. And it triggered, I didn't say anything, did not say anything in the moment. I had to process, had to process that. But I just, I, I left there just first feeling this overwhelming sense of disappointment mm -hmm. and fear and worry and um, like a loss of self. And reflecting on that now, I'm not surprised because I was still in victim mode. I wasn't in an awakened place in my life. And I was still, I still had this subconscious belief that my life was happening to me and that I had no control. And I, for a lot of my life, had allowed people to dictate my choices. And so I, this was kind of the first time that I started to question that. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't questioning from a place of like, well, I get to decide. It was more like, screw you, I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I fought really hard against that internally. And um, I, you know, worked, I, I, I probably... It probably uh, manifested itself more than anything in in my um, my work ethic, right? And just like working all the time to like be able to afford therapy and um, help to get him to and from therapy so that I could work and you know just like this constant like drive to prove this person wrong. Mm. And I really fought against that narrative, and I I could have accepted it. I could have accepted that narrative, despite the reasons why I, I fought against it and how, which probably weren't all that healthy at the time. Um, I'm so grateful that I didn't just accept somebody else's truth um, or somebody else's opinion of how my life would go. I wasn't having it. I still have to fight against it. You know, it's it's uh, coming to your, your question about the lifestyle. It's he's 10. And um, he has a lot of, he likes to be alone. He likes to be at home. He has, um, you know, very rigid routines and he doesn't like to wait. And if I'm on zoom and he wants to talk, he's, Hey mom, <laughs> I want to go swimming. <laughs> like he doesn't, he, he doesn't, he's what I love about him. And also the same thing that drives me nuts is that he has zero regard. He's probably like, my spiritual beacon because like he mm. is my constant reminder to just be who you are because he just is who he is all the time. He is the most unintentional, unapologetic person on the planet. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> His MO is just unapologetic. His mm. hair is how it is. He's wearing shorts when it's snowing and like he doesn't mm. care, right? Like that's what he wants to do and he's doing it. And um, so- so it it's it requires me to be present and it's pulled it pulls me out of my work it pulls me out of my pattern and um requires me to be present and sometimes it's not fun like sometimes it's being present for a meltdown mm -hmm. and sometimes it's being present for like a 3 hour tantrum and it's stressful it's really really stressful but it has again like really served me in um, my spiritual growth because it's required me 
and, and taught me how to access new levels of compassion, mm. new levels of unconditional love, acceptance. Um, the biggest thing for me really right now, and, and the biggest lesson that, that is presenting through, through him is, um, is being okay with, uh, with judgment, right? Like mm. we fly in an airplane to Disney world and, and the people in front of us are, are talking negatively about him and just, you know, the way he chews, the way he's breathing and making fun of him, these young girls. And I'm sitting there like, just wanting to, you know, like ring, ring their necks. Like, why are you saying those things? Right. But it, like, that's just how it is sometimes. And I, I just, it's coming to terms with that and not, not taking that on, hmm. you know, as, as truth and not like being afraid of, of, of being seen and being judged and being different. I'm sorry that you had that experience. That really sucks. You know, I'm really, really grateful for it. I'm really, really grateful for it. And I, I appreciate that, but, um, I wouldn't be do, I wouldn't be where I am without it. Yeah. And I, I truly, truly believe that it was part of my life that was designed for me. It was, it's part of, it's part of all of this. It's part of my mission. It's part of what allows me to learn and grow and, and get to a place where I can help other people do the same. Yeah. And quite honestly, that level of, of compassion has really helped me to, um, let go of a lot of things, mm. you know, let go of like stuff with my parents, you know, mm. exes, all the stuff that we carry around that we just, we, we don't need to hold on to. And so he just, he reminds me just of like the simplicity of, of life really. I mean, I think mm. So often we just overcomplicate our existence and the unlearning, the delayering, the simplifying is really where it's at. I think that's really what, what the spiritual journey is all about. It's just about, um, just coming home, hmm. just coming home to that pure loving piece of ourselves. Hmm. The great, one of the greatest lessons that I learned from Annie was that same piece like she didn't care if other people stared at her in the store like she couldn't have cared less about that yeah. <laughs> I'm the one who cared you know yeah. and yeah. and I learned so much from her about yeah about the power of presence about the power of accepting th that her life was the way that it was and um the what came in for me while you were talking is this, the, the phrase that nothing is a barrier to reaching our full potential. Nothing is a barrier to reaching that. And what I think is so delightfully surprising about what that doctor said to you was that he couldn't have been more wrong because mm -hmm. what some people see as a barrier to reaching full potential in one area they don't see is the key to reaching the full, your full potential in the most important areas. So true. Yeah. It may, so you know, it may have made it impossible for me to have the career that I, I would have thought I wanted with a, with a daughter that has had the disease that Annie did. Um, but I couldn't have foreseen that my life was so rich is so rich yeah. as a result of being her mom. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have Agreed. anticipated that. And it's, it's such an interesting that the, the non-spiritual world has it all backwards, you know, like the non-spiritual yes. aspects of things, the non-spiritual thinking says that, um, that disability is a curse or that disability is, you know, all the wrong things. And, and what I see is that the the spiritual aspect and the understanding that we're we're all in this together, this is all for our good, flips that on its head. And it says what yes. you think, what you think you know you don't, and what you think is bad is not necessarily bad, and what you think is good isn't necessarily good. And it's only through the walking through those things and the tapping into that deeper part of ourselves that we really see it with new eyes and see it Correct. with gratitude and see it with it, it embracing uh, I can't even like put into words what I'm trying to say <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'll interject and say when you 
recognize and accept that there is this plan for you or there is something that you're supposed to do or bring to this world that's meaningful Mm. on some level beyond a job title beyond a relationship like something that and it doesn't need to be something that the whole world sees Mm. right it could be just really spreading joy in your your job right like whatever that job is might even be you know working as a cashier and like those people that just you're having a bad day and they like they just smile and they ask you how you're doing and they're you know they just they bring that joy so it doesn't really matter what you're doing but there's something within you that you are meant to contribute and that it's uniquely yours and that the things that happen to you that are painful and that are bad, Hmm. bad, don't feel good, are part of that, right? And when you can recognize those things is that instead of life is cruel and life is happening to me, which is typically the non-spiritual viewpoint. And I can say that because I've been there and I've felt that way. Like life is cruel and and, and these things are, are terrible. And when you can see them through a different light, to your point, you can, you can view them from a different perspective. You can, you can detach from what's happening and why is this happening to me? And I'm flawed or what did I do wrong? Or why did the other person do I mean, Remove all of that stuff, remove the blame, the judgment, the ego stuff. And you can just say, what is the lesson for me in this situation? And you can focus on the lesson. Then you can actually do something about it to bring forth your unique mission package, like whatever it is you have to deliver, you can actually bring that forward. And when you can see your life and your story in that way, then life becomes a lot easier and more exciting. And also you become a hell of a lot more resilient, Mm. hell of a lot more resilient because you're, you're, you become grateful for the really sucky things (laughs) um, that like without them, your life just wouldn't be the same. And so I think that that's, again, where you're right. This, this, we, we have it all backwards. Hmm. We have it all backwards. And I think sometimes we spend too much time really digging into um, this like heavy, heavy mental analysis of where did I go wrong? And, and, hmm. and like, what's wrong with me? And um, why did this person do this to me? And why, what's wrong with them? And, you know, now I need to have this pattern. I need to watch out for this really we should spend more time thinking about what do we want and Mm -hmm. like what does that look like and how do we embody that and how do we want to show up for ourselves and other people and you know what qualities do we want to um to bring forth and what do we want to cultivate what do we want to share as we spend too much time in the mental analysis of what was Mm -hmm. instead of visualizing and and getting excited about feeling into what could be. Hmm. Yeah. That's where the the power of choice is introduced when, when we do zoom out enough and say, okay, like what are, what are my options here? What, and what do I want? I mean, many people go through life, not ever asking themselves that question. What do I actually want? Most people, when they start working with me, they don't know the answer to that question. The two questions I ask them in the very beginning of any session of our very first session is who are you? Tell me who you are. Can't answer that question very well. And um, what do you want? You know, we become so accustomed to doing what is expected that we don't even know what we want or who we are anymore. You know, we literally just become um, pattern and autopilot. Mm-hmm. How do you suggest people start to internally sort through and find the answers to those questions? Yeah, I would say if, I mean, I have exercises for that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I would say if you're not working through that with someone, um, I would say just getting quiet, just getting quiet, sitting down with a journal and just writing. It's Mm -hmm. amazing what can come forward when you just give yourself the space. But so many people resist doing it 
they'll say they don't have any time or they'll have, they have a lot of excuses. And what they're really saying subconsciously is like, I'm afraid. Hmm. I am really scared to go in there and like really, really know and feel that because that means I may have to deal with something that I really don't want to deal with that I've sucked (laughs) on for a long time. Yeah. Or like my life might change. And even though it's could be exciting. Change is always scary, right? And there's a lot of fear there. So what will happen if I acknowledge that like, I want more? Mm -hmm. Um, And does that make me selfish? Um, You can be grateful and also, you you can be grateful and also want more. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't often see that. So I think just getting quiet, just getting, just start with getting quiet and just giving yourself some space and permission to allow something to come forward. And it's usually a lot easier to do with a pen and piece of paper. I've noticed- and maybe when, some journal prompts. <laughs> oh, for sure. I've noticed when I do, when I do um, some like free writing in my journal, I can tell when I'm not being honest. Even yes. nobody else is looking, nobody else yeah. is gonna see that paper, <laughs> but like I, yeah. I feel it when I'm not telling the truth. And so for people that are wanting to do this exercise, Mm -hmm. listen for that knowing (laughs) when you've hit on the, what is real for you Mm -hmm. and pay attention to that. And the, the really, the really wonderful thing too, is that I think like that first, that first baby step within that is knowing what you want and then and then you get to choose whether or not you want to do something about it. So someone may mm-hmm. in that exercise know that they want to quit their job and do something different. That doesn't mean that you have to. The power is in knowing that you have choice. Yeah. So maybe yes. you don't quit your job, but then what that does for you is that when you're in the job and you're having a crappy day, then you are like, I'm choosing to be here right now. And it's different than what you said of like, when you're having a crappy day and you're like, why is this happening to me? Then it's, you are <laughs> yes. always introducing the choice and like, I'm choosing to be in this job right now for mm-hmm. X, Y, Z reason, knowing yes. that on a deeper level, like I don't necessarily want to be here, but like I'm choosing this right now. And I think mm-hmm. that that is really helpful too, for people to just give themselves permission to look at what they want, knowing yes. that they don't necessarily have to do anything with it right now. They just, just knowing that it's there is like, what starts to build up that Mm self-trust. Yeah. You know, I would agree with that. And I would say um, making a choice to do something about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe it's not that you leave your job, but maybe it's that you decide to, you know, get to know a different coworker. So Mm -hmm. you don't feel lonely at Um, you know, it's just like, there are so many things within that, you know, we tend to like, especially high achievers tend to think like they need to do something huge or they Mm. need to like be black and white, or they need to like rip the band. It's like, you do not have to do that to your point. You don't have to burn down your life. Mm. Um, and, and if you do, you probably need some support before doing that. (laughs) Right. Um, but yeah, just, just start to allow yourself to be curious. Mm allow yourself to be curious. And, um, if you're really, really committed to change and to growth, seek the assistance of somebody who you feel comfortable with, who can guide you deeper Hmm. because a lot of the time our surface level choices are actually rooted in much bigger issues that we need to, to, to heal or to confront. I get so many people that come to me and they say, I want a new job. And especially because, you know, I've spent a decade in recruiting. And so I, I, people come to me all the time. I want a new job. Why do you want a new job? Well, I hate my boss. Why do you hate your boss? Hmm. I feel insignificant. Okay. That's like a childhood wound and a trauma response that is going to cause them to completely uproot their career and they love, they love the work. Hmm. Right. And it's, it's the dynamic of that relationship. And so it's sometimes not that you need to change the environment 
or the circumstance. It's changing your inner Hmm. being. (laughs) It's changing how it's changing your inner reaction to that. And you can't do that until you're aware of that. So I think whether it's a coach or a therapist, I, I, I mean, I've said this on my social, but like I have multiple therapists and coaches that I work with on Hmm. all different things in my life. And I always will. You got to, you got to constantly have like these other perspectives to help you get really, really deep. And there's always more to unfold. Hmm. What I like about your illustration of someone who wants to leave their job is yeah. If they leave their job, they might solve that external problem, but the internal problem follows them to their next job. So there's not really like, there's not really something that is solved long-term or the tools are not in place to help deal with those types of, you know, relationships and triggers that are going to continue to come up. And, um, so before we get off, we're going to wrap up our time Mm -hmm. together, but do you have maybe just a couple of like really practical tools? We've already talked about some of them with, you know, mindfulness, with journaling meditation, but what are some of the practical tools that you use when you, Mm -hmm. um, want to be, closely in tuned with, um, your higher self, with your guides, with the, with divine purpose and, um, Mm -hmm. and connection. Yeah. So I would say, um, what comes to my consciousness is first of all, um, get into the habit when you're upset of asking yourself what you're really upset about. Hmm. So when you notice like this overwhelm of negative emotion, it's what am I really upset about? And keep asking yourself that question until you have nothing left because what you'll end up getting to is something very deep. Mm. If you keep going and going and going until you have nothing left and you'll often start out with, um, you know, I'm upset about my, my, my boss. And, you know, you might end up at like, I don't feel loved Mm. or I don't feel heard. Um, and that is what is showing you where you still need to do some healing and where you need to focus your attention before you then go and, you know, burn your house, your life down into the studs or go and change your job to your point and then end up bouncing around. It's like, really ask yourself what you're really, really upset about and go as deep as you can. It also really helps you to just like disconnect from blame. Hmm. Yeah. So that would be probably the most practical, practical thing I would leave people with is, um, once you've exhausted on the piece of paper, all of your ego stuff, hmm. you know, then you, <laughs> you can kind of get to the bottom of like, hang on a minute. It's, this is about me. Anytime we're upset, hmm. it's about you. It's not about the other person. It's always about you. It's always something within you. Hmm. So what is going on within me? And that's how you get to the center of yourself is you just, you, you question everything. You start questioning that, that, um, that tailspin. So anytime in a situation where you have an emotional reaction that is out of proportion with what the circumstance actually calls for, then you understand like, oh, there's some digging that I can do here because it's, there's something deeper here than just the surface interaction. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even say out of proportion because what is out of proportion, right? I mean, I just Mm. think anytime that you have a, that you find yourself in a, a, a negative state is, is getting curious about where that negative negativity and those um, uneasy emotions, whatever they are, where they're coming from, Mm. because there's a place within you that, that needs to be healed. Mm. And so our emotions are our greatest informants. Mm. So when we can use that information and not just suppress it or, you know, feel it, of course, but really understand it because also understanding it sometimes alleviates the feeling, Mm. right? Like, oh, I'm not really pissed off at my husband because he's horrible and all these things. I'm just really upset because sometimes I don't feel seen. And like, maybe I just need to go and tell him, hey, like, I just need you to acknowledge this. And then you do that and then it's done and it's washed Mm. and the conflict is gone. So you know, otherwise you just sit there and stew for like three days and just right. waste all this energy. <laughs> it's like, I really think just doing that simple process helps you um, figure out what is the aligned action that I need to take? Hmm. You know, what, what is it? And if I have a free challenge actually on my, um, my Instagram bio 
for people. It's a five day challenge called experiments and expansion. And, Mm. um, one of the days, uh, has this, this, each one has these different tools and processes, but one of them is, um, related to this is like really understanding what's underneath your patterns, Mm. um, so that you can make a a different decision. You either negotiate, you either communicate, let it go or set a boundary. Mm. So there's actually a, um, a grid there for like working through the things that come up and deciding like, what is the best course of action for you? That's, that's most aligned, That that isn't just like an emotional, uh, instantaneous reaction. So I would encourage anybody who is looking for a starting place. That's fun and easy to, to check that out because it's, uh, self-paced and, um, just five emails and very easy. I love that. And we'll put all the information in the show notes, uh, along with Marissa's Instagram information, um, so that you can easily find her offers. And if you want to work with her, all of her information's in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for your time today and your expertise. And, um, I'm certain that my audience will come away with not only really practical, practical tools, but also a deeper understanding of the interconnectedness of all things and how we get to make positive change in our lives, that that is always accessible to us. So thank you. You're welcome. I would say it's your birthright. Mm. So, you know, your life is, is yours. So I would leave people with that. And I, mm. I am so grateful for you. So thank you. Thank you, Marissa. And before we go, PS, we expire.